Preston True, so good to talk to you, buddy. Love it. Thanks for the Business invite. Business coach extraordinaire back for our, what's our third time. I believe you're correct. Number three. So it's either a charm <laughs> or something else. Yeah. Curse. <laughs> Just can't get rid of you, buddy. <laughs> Some people have said that. Yeah. How long have we known each other? I think I've asked you this before. I think we get so 2024, probably it's got to be seven years. So I jumped into EOS uh, seven. Yeah, 27. Yeah, so, so. seven years. Yeah. Seven-ish years, maybe a little bit less, a little bit more. So you and I both are coaches, obviously, and um, one of the things I'm really excited to pick your brain about and to just talk about is our challenges as coaches, the sort of um, the sort of reasons why we coach. The things that we see in business owners, in uh, leadership teams that are just dumb and awesome and compelling and ridiculous. You know, we have a ton of uh, experience, a ton of, I don't know, life between the two of us that we've seen. Um, We've seen folks nail it. We've seen folks screw it up. We have folks ask us all the time, hey, coach, how should I handle this? And we give it to them straight, and then they go off and do something different or something really, really stupid. You know, it kind of reminds me of when the, the, the rich man walks up to Jesus and says, hey, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? Mm. And, you know, he tells him, I think he says, you know, go sell all your stuff. And, and, and the guy walks away down you know downtrodden or whatever because he's really rich and sometimes i think that happens when someone comes to us and says hey what do i need to do to fix my business Mm. and you're like well that's a big deal it's a big question but here's some basics and they end up not doing it you know they end up kind of Going, well, what else have you got there, Coach? <laughs> so that's what, some of those things I want to hear and talk about. I think um, the listener would appreciate our angle on some of that. Yeah. Um, I want to talk to you about what you're reading, what you're learning. Um, you know, favorite tools of yours, hacks, approaches, tips, tricks. You know, the business owner, operators listening to us and saying, I think I'm going to try that on my own or whatever. You know, it's cool. Um, But uh, throw them a bone here. See what, see what, you know, just pick your brain a little bit on some of that stuff. So I love it. I love it. So uh, where are you at in your practice right now? Give, give, um, give us a five minute, you know, kind of summary, one minute summary of like, here's what your business is like. Uh, So you had a five minute, I love that. That was quick, man. Yeah. Let's do five minutes. Wait a minute. Let's Wait, actually do minute. one minute. <laughs> yeah. You only got 30 seconds left. <laughs> right, <so>. Exactly. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, we're blessed. Right. And like, that's the shortest version of it. We're blessed. Mm-hmm. I'm doing the work that I've been put on this earth to do. I some days have moments of magnificence in my own mind. Mm-hmm. Oftentimes I get that feedback from clients like, you nailed it, that mm. one thing you helped me see. And then there are other times that I'll literally get feedback like, yeah, that was a really kind of crappy conversation mm. or that was not the day that we thought it was going to be. So it's just, it's a, for me, it's the greatest vehicle, Mark, to explore how I can, I can help entrepreneurs get as fit as possible through their business, using their business as, as the gym, if you will. And at the same time, be listening for what's working and not working so that I can apply it. I, this may be a trite thing to say, but like, I'm in this business because I need this kind of help as much as anybody does. And I, I just, I've re- I finally realized and reconciled the best way for me to learn is teach it. 
uh, the best way may way for me to learn is like immerse myself in the same process. The thing is, my clients are offering that that laboratory for me to actually experiment on our own on our own business. Mm-hmm. So, I, if, if you if if there's a coach, if there's someone in the coaching business that's there to be on a stage or there to be the smartest person in the room, they should yeah they should consider finding another line of work. Mm. Yeah, that's that's great. I th- I think that's uh something I've I've been asking a number of mm, my guests when they are uh advisory folks or um business owners that have done a good job picking advisory folks is hey, how do you what's a good way to pick a coach? What's a good way to not just pick a coach but pick an advisor? And that's kind of what we are. I think is um, one of several important advisors in the business operators world, you know, and they ought to have a handful of key folks that they can call on that can help them, right? And um, and so if you were to let's say let's say your son were to come to you. Uh, Henry, right? And let's say Henry's 40. He's not. What is he? 23. 20, 23. Okay. So let's say he's 40 and he's got this business and he comes to you and says, Dad, I want to pick some advisors. How do I do it? Hmm. What would you tell him? Uh, find somebody that's been there before, hmm. not for their technical knowledge, mm-hmm. but that they've got a level of empathy mm-hmm. that someone that's not been down that path before may very well have great skills and experience. They're not going to have that empathy. And it's interesting, Mark, because before we started our conversation today, I was, well, as, we, as you were kind of warming us up here, I like to look at, I don't know if it's polarity, but like uh, A versus B, right? Or, or C versus D. And one of the things I wrote down was advocate versus advisor. Mm. And so you use the term advisor, which I really appreciate. I sometimes, there's not a right word to use. Advisor's great. Advocate for me is the com- is an advisor that has empathy. Mm. Huh. Because I'm, I'm advocating for you to win. I'm advocating for you to take that next step that you might not take on your own. I'm advocating for your learning, for your growth, for you to push through the challenging times. Uh, But I also have a responsibility that if I've been down a path before and I can offer some tangible, practical, pragmatic experience, ideally that works, you're going to ask that of me as as well. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, not to not to overemphasize, but the last 10 years of doing this specific type of coaching work inside the world of like a business organizing framework and systems, like the systems may be great, the tools may be great, the process may be great, but if me as a guide or a coach, I'm, I'm unwilling to say, I, you know, I've been, I've been there before. Like it's a, it's a dark place. It's a tough place. You know what, Mark, you might need to hang out there for a while. Here's the thing. I'm going to hang out with you. I'm still going to be your advocate, even in some darker days. Um, and we're going to figure out a way to get out. Now, one of the best parts about being in this business is the moment I say something like that, I have now taken on the mantle or responsibility. I've got to help find a solution, at least bring some alternatives, some options for solution. Because we don't know what we don't know. Right? We've confronted a situation that we've never we've never experienced before. Mm-hmm. Like, I, um, uh, my wife is a is a writer, been a writer for a long time, and she'll commiserate on this. A blank sheet of paper can be one of the most threatening visual experiences for many many people. Mm. Give me just a point or a, write an arrow on that blank yeah. sheet of paper. Go that direction. Don't just yeah. give me a blank sheet of paper. Yeah. Yeah. I found that with clients um, when we get to this place like, let's say, warehouse, 
we were talking about it earlier. Mm -hmm. You know, I have a client that that epiphany happened where they're like, holy crap, we don't, nobody owns the warehouse. We don't even call the warehouse the warehouse, right? It's just this elephant in the room that everybody's been ignoring. Meanwhile, the elephant's been eating tons of money uh, and creating all these problems and trampling stuff. So that blank sheet of paper problem, uh, what I'll do to eliminate that for the client is break out a really, really generic but robust outline. Like, well, so if we figured out Warehouse 2.0, there's some basic elements here. There's like, well, there's um, we need a uh, some clear goals or purposes. So, you know, write that on a board, bullet point. Second, or actually I do a checkbox. Second is, uh, well, we probably need uh, a, a real strategy or a, or a modality. Like, oh, we're going to do warehouse this way. I'm, there's probably 10 ways to do warehouse. I mean, I don't know, right? But, but I'm sure there's all these warehouse experts out there that have in their back pocket, here's how you warehouse. So let's pick one. So we pick a modality or a, a framework or a platform or a, you know, whatever. Um, then, um, we'll do a dry run or we'll gather all the key players, uh, and then we'll put together a budget and then we'll do a dry run and then we'll check it and then we'll ink it, you know, or something like a very, very simple project plan, um, and put that on the board and then say, there, there's your skeleton. Now you guys have, don't have a blank sheet of paper. Let's fill in the blank. Somebody can take this and start working it. And when we check all these boxes, we've got Warehouse 2.0 in the can. So, yeah, the blank sheet of paper is terrifying, especially to these operators that uh, they know how to, they just know how to work, but they don't typically know how to sit back and think or sit back and observe uh, that's not a strength of theirs, you know. Do you find that with your clients? So I love how the observation piece, um, the sh ability to hit the pause button, so the ability to back off the short-term, the demand for short-term results and focus rather on like push our thinking out longer term. Um, one of the one of the most common experiences I have with clients as a as a coach is like we want it done now. So uh, we've got a shortfall the last couple of quarters on revenue, and what we need to do is this next quarter, the next ninety days, we need to make it up. That's a fairly, I mean, it's a maybe a very overly simplified example, but it's mm -hmm. a it's a common one. Yeah. Well, the thing is, like, how you got to the revenue shortfall this last two quarters didn't take place. The root causes didn't take place the last two quarters. The root causes took place a year ago. The root causes took place. You took your foot off the gas on business development. You took your foot off the gas relationship building, account management. Mm -hmm. You took your foot off the gas a year, two years ago. Why? Because things were good. So like, how do you remedy an issue that's actually been building for the last 18 to 24 months? It's not gonna take 90 days to solve. Right. And so like helping clients, like that's why the advocacy piece is the, I understand, right? I understand that you're frustrated. I understand that this is a concern. I understand this is actually a critical issue to solve, but at the end of the day, it's like, Helping, helping them understand like the, the boat isn't, like, we're not going underwater all the way over the next 90 days. You know, getting and, and just helping them push that long-term view. One of the best books, so I'm gonna kind of drop, probably end up dropping just a few book titles. You know I've been in a Strategic Coach before, Dan Sullivan, love 95% of what Strategic Coach, Coach puts out there. Um, the 5% that doesn't resonate probably just doesn't res resonate with me or 
um, you know, Dan Sullivan is such an inventor and like s such an amazing thinker that he's, he, he's, and he's willing to put stuff out there that might not work as well as some other things. Um, the 25 year framework. So 25 year framework uh, is a very short book. Uh, Sullivan started writing these quarterly books. Basically, if you the the flight time between Chicago and Toronto, you can read the book on that flight one one way. It was a profound realization for me how short term I was thinking. So what if you pushed out 25 years from now, what would be an amazing result you'd love to produce? So you go out 25 years. Well, how many quarters are in 25 years? And this is where I'm gonna probably need some help on math. I think it's 100 quarters. Yeah. And if I can do the yeah. math. Four times 25. Yeah, right. I mean, I can, yeah, that's third grade. I mean, I, I did get, I quit after fourth grade. A, a, di a different story for another conversation with my daughter. No, it does. she hasn't called me dad in like 10 years. She called me depressed, but she recently started calling me my high school GPA. I won't share that right now. Um, which by the way, would communicate why I'm not so great in math. Um, that 100 quarters translates to, like, okay, so if I got to work every 90 days on that 25-year goal, I just need to accomplish 2.5% of that, right? Did I do the math correctly? Well, it'd be uh, one one-hundredth yep. every quarter. Okay, so let's. that sounds better. One one-hundredth mm -hmm. of that 25-year goal. Mm -hmm. so I, it's 1%. I, 1%, mm -hmm. even better, see? Thanks for your help in the math. There you go. <laughs> the one percent. Yeah, one percent a quarter. How much pressure yeah. did that just like you? How much pressure did that take off hmm. of us? I don't have to make up for the revenue shortfall this quarter. I distinguish this long-term goal that, by the way, is going to account for us growing as an organization from a revenue perspective, ideally primarily from a profitability or capability perspective. I just, all, like the weight of the world gets lifted off my shoulder when I realize I don't have to accomplish 100% this quarter. I need to accomplish 1%. All we did was say, stop making the goal the making up of your revenue shortfall. Start making the goal something really desirable way out there in the future that's bigger than your current capabilities can accomplish. But let's walk through that. And the more clients I've had that have promised bigger, it's been really interesting to see. It was just with a client this last week that when I first met them, uh, three owners, ultimately four owners, one of them sold out, three owners did not get along. It was probably one of the most contentious and really uncomfortable relationships to, to be around. And where like literally it was almost almost fisticuffs in in a planning meeting. Through this, and like we don't we, we ultimately want to sell this business in some way, shape, or form, but in the current state that the business is in, because of the really cancerous relationship that the owners had with one another, like it wasn't going anywhere. So the the short term was you know, how do we increase revenue? How do we increase earnings? How do we put more money in our pocket? Again, I, I'm a card carrying capitalist. I believe in all of that. But what we did was let's fast forward 10 years and imagine what would the ideal relationship between the three of you look like? What like do we, Capable we, relationship, ideal, uh, what do you mean by ideal? So like either, so it could look like you're all divorced from one another. Mm -hmm. That's one flavor. It could be you're all best buddies vacationing and your families get together you know, three times a year. Or it could be we have a relationship in which we can come to the table, we can discuss, debate, negotiate, but be here, not, not get wrapped around the axle about what we our individual opinions demand. We actually can say, you know what, for the greater good of the organization long term, we should move in this particular direction. In other words, actually be able to come to the table and negotiate on a regular basis negotiate in a healthy manner that allows us to create clear outcomes, clear actions, and communicate that to others so they can help out. All we did was start pushing their thinking out. Mm -hmm. So what did they do over the last five years? They, their relationship is exponentially better. 
one of the short-term tactics was like getting really cl clear on who wants to play what role. One of the owners did not want to be in the like the owner seat, so to speak. Still, literally an owner, right? Mm -hmm. From a, a, a legal and financial perspective, mm -hmm. I don't want to have that responsibility of like being on the leadership team. I'm going to mm -hmm. step off. I'm going to go do work in this area of the business that I have a skill set for and that I love to do. He stepped away from our process. The other two stayed engaged and made it a regular goal to actually, and we just, you may do the same thing. I love to, I love to put everything on a 10 point scale. Like Mark, how would you rate our relationship today on a 10 point mm -hmm. scale? 10 mm -hmm. would be intimate, great, like it couldn't be any better. One would be, it's absolutely a disaster. You just rate, mm -hmm. okay, we're at a six, got it. Next quarter, how do we come in and say it's a seven? Mm -hmm. What would we see? What would we do? We went through that process. Mm -hmm. And just like helping to improve there. So making it as measurable as possible. All in the context though of what is it we actually, why are we even improving this relationship? Mm -hmm. So all of that coming back is like, there's a, there's a few different paths we were taking. But I come back to that 25 year framework, all we were doing is like pushing their thinking out beyond like, no, Mark, you pissed me off yesterday and you need to remedy that. Like seriously, that's not gonna get us anywhere. Super short term thinking versus Mark, how do we improve our relationship by one point or a half point over the next 90 days? At the end of the year, four quarters, how, do, how will we have improved it two points? All we're doing is we're just pushing thinking out. I have to remember that in my own business, in my own world. We were just sharing uh, this afternoon. I think there's some clouds that are going to be heading our way in mm -hmm. terms of just presenting some challenges and perhaps some storms for us in our own business. Mm -hmm. And one of the best things that I know to do is like rather than get all bent about around fear of what might happen tomorrow or the next day, it's like, what are we actually building 20 years out, 15 mm -hmm. years out? Yeah. Yeah, that's 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 really I I would love to I want to hang out on that a couple parts of that. One is that long term thinking is not a part of our psyche generally. Uh, it is in some other cultures. Uh, in the Jewish culture, uh, in some Eastern European cultures, um, in Chinese, uh, traditional Chinese, and in current Chinese culture. You know, I mean, they have a 50-year plan, you know, the Chinese government, 100-year plan. Mark, it, um, the, like, s dive into and understand, like, find, like, for anybody listening, like, take a look, just search, find as much information you can on, on that, on the, on the Chinese thought process, politically, militarily, economically, man, they are so far into the future with their thinking. Yeah. And what that does is that creates, that demands patience. Mm -hmm. And when you're patient, those short-term storms that they inevitably encounter, like they're fine with those things. Mm. So, Certainly yeah. in my world, not advocating for a lot of the things that China is doing. Right. One of the things that they have, they're a, a terrific exemplar of, is that long term yeah. thinking. And, and that's actually, you kind of helped me clarify it. The gift it gives us is that patience. Hmm. And in those short term storms that inevitably will arise, if I can use patience as a is some protection from those storms, well, then there's going to be a bunch of storms that arrive. Yeah. You know, we're going to have a shortfall in revenue. We're going to have an earnings issue, right? I'm going to have somebody who I thought was a rock star on my, you know, distribution team who's turned out to be cancerous. Well, I don't need to get wrapped around the axle about that. It's like, it, okay, it's just like it's a you know it's kind of a thunderstorm we're dealing with right now. That's okay. Guess what happens with thunderstorms? They always finish. They always move on. Mm -hmm. Have you found as you're so as you're starting to work with a client, and you start talking about this element of the big picture, the long term picture, 
five, 10 years out, 20 years out. Um, how have you hacked or helped them get into that mode? Because it, it's, it's challenging. I have a hard time doing it too. And, you know, and it's for good reason, you know, these folks that are running these businesses are, they are in triage mode, you know, they're in firefighting mode, uh, in firefighting mode, you're not thinking about, you know, the, how you're going to hand this house off to your grandkids or something like that. You're thinking about how am I going to put this fire out right right now? It's urgent. It's present. It's moment by moment. It's, uh, you're taking things that are meant for one thing and using them for another thing because of, you know, because of, you're MacGyvering the heck out of everything. Uh, just because, you know, right now is all that matters. Um, you know, almost like in a survival mentality. Um, so how do you, what's your experience like in getting folks to shift how they think? So I didn't have language for this until literally this last weekend. I was sharing with you a dear friend of mine, um, Father Mark Livingston. Uh, I, I sought him out for some counsel. I, I realized like when I believe I'm, when the seas are going to, get rough and storms are gonna come in for me in my business or my life, uh, I immediately get into action and finding guides. Like I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go talk to a number of different people, not a lot of different people, a small group who are, who are advocates mm -hmm. for me, are advisors for me. Mm -hmm. And I sat down with him this last weekend and he shared something. He said, you know, Preston, the devil is like he, devil's after us. So wherever anybody is in their faith life, just you know, bear with me because uh, the point will 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 make sense. Uh, the devil tempts us with two things. Number one, he's after us all the time, but he tempts us with two things. He tempts us with the worry and concern about the future, mm -hmm. and he tempts us with the regret and guilt of the past. If we fall victim to that temptation, we end up spending a lot of time in the future worrying about what hasn't happened yet and what might not even happen, and or we spend time in the past, regret and guilt were overwhelmed by, and what I realize is the reaction to the guilt and overwhelm is to try to fix it, try to get it to go away. The reaction to the worry about the future is, I have to do something, like I have to do this massive action right now. So rather than be tempted by what the devil is interested in, God wants us to just be right here, right now in this very moment. Okay, so how do I translate that with, you know, my spiritual advisor conversation to like working with clients? What I mean by I never really had the language until literally this last weekend. I realized that if I can help a client make a simple decision today, what can we decide upon today based on what we know? We can't, let's go back to, I've got this, and this was literally, Yes, in yesterday's uh, planning meeting with a client, they've got they've identified three people issues, and one of the people issues, one of the leadership team members, like re you could tell, he's really wrestling with like, what do I do? Like, I know this is a problem, but I, like, how do I how do I solve it? And all we did was ask me, hey, Jack, what's the what's the one decision you can make today based on what you know? And by the way, we're not going to judge you for what you do or don't know you're the, you have the visibility on what you actually know. So just tap into that. And like, what's the decision you can make? And he paused for a moment. He said, I can probably clarify the job duties for this person's role. Awesome. What's the action that comes from that decision? Well, by next week, I will have re revised a job description. I will have, uh, would have, passed it around to the leadership team to get their feedback. And we can say, this is what it is. This next week I'll sit down with my direct report and we'll simply have a review of what we believe the real job description is versus what he believes the job description mm -hmm. is. All of that being said, I don't know if that's gonna solve it. Here's what happened though. We went from Jack being frozen by fear of what might happen in the future or might not and we went to right now, 
What's the decision you can make? And what's the action that follows suit? Like, that's it. Like, it's literally, like, I don't need to figure out, <laughs> I'm gonna try to come up with another analogy. I don't need to figure out how to swim out of this pond that I'm in. I just need to figure out, like, how can I just keep my nose above water for the next 30 seconds so I can actually get a view of which direction to swim? Like, don't worry about getting totally out of the pond. Just like get by yourself some time so you can have some visibility. It goes back to that 25 year framework, like longer term thinking promotes patience. Patience promotes clearer thinking and the ability to weather storms. All of that was happening yesterday, like it literally in that moment. So long answer response to your, to your, your, question mark it, tactically ask somebody even though your concern about the future is valid based on any everything you know in this moment what's the one decision you can make and what's the one action that comes from that decision it's literally rinse and repeat rinse and repeat decide act decide act here's what happens you do that every single day over the course of 90 days you're gonna have a great quarter hmm. So when you're working with a client and say, hey, let's think about 25, 10, five years from now. Um, and they're like, uh, my phone's ringing, my email's going off. Uh, this afternoon, this shipment's going out. Tomorrow we've got this, you know, the GC coming in to start this this warehouse re rebuild. Uh, you know, we're, you know, we got $10 million of product going wherever next week and and you're asking me to think about five years from now, right? Um, so how do you talk them? How how do you talk to them about that and get them to? Because a lot of times these folks, um, they don't know what they don't know. They they they're they're good at making things happen. They're they're clearly effective at some level at sitting in that seat, whatever, whether it's CFO, CEO, COO, whatever it is. Um. But somehow you've got to get them to pick their head up and look out into the future and get them to build, to set their ship on that course that's going to get to that future at the same time as they are putting out fires in the present. And so it's kind of like this duality where they, they have to be good at fighting fires and good at looking out into the future and be able to kind of pivot between those two mindsets fairly rhythmically or fairly regularly, not like every five minutes, but maybe one day a week or every one day a month or something. They have to have a, a pivot point. So um, so what are your some of your, I don't know, hacks around getting them to see that? Uh <laughs> If I have a hack, it's probably like a bottle of bourbon I always mm. keep in the office. Um, so I don't want to say hack. Uh, so uh, actually, sorry, curiosity. Mm. I don't have the answers. Mm. I can ask questions. Mm -hmm. I can ask some presumptive questions. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't want to, you know, I'm certainly not so wise as to be able to ask the best questions ever. What are the weeds you currently find yourself entangled with. So one of the common things, especially with entrepreneurial leadership teams, uh, my stereotype is you and I get together, we start a business. We didn't start the business and then have an entire staff of people to do all the work. You and I probably were hands-on in the very first days of the business that you and I start together. So we're probably gifted technically in whatever business we have. And because we're gifted technically and we seem to work well together, we have success. And then the success creates more opportunity for us. Well, eventually we're gonna reach capacity, we've gotta hire people, and then the business grows, right? We have more people, we have more projects, we have more customers, clients, we have a lot more going on. The thing is, if I'm still attached to the weeds of when you and I first started the business, man, there's no hope for me for thinking long-term. Mm -hmm. There's no hope for me to actually solve the bigger issues or directional issues of an organization. So that's a 
long way to say, I, I just invite you to consider, Mark, like what weeds do you find yourself find yourself entangled with? Mm -hmm. Because if it's the weeds of lower level tasks in the organization, which frequently it is, then the first order of business is we got to get you to stop doing that kind of work. And what will happen is you actually will get a whole bunch of time back. And what will happen is when you get time back, that's breathing room. And when you have breathing room, your ability to think further into the future will grow exponentially. Dan Martell is, so you, you just YouTube Dan Martell, it's M-A-R-T-E-L-L. -L. He started a entrepreneur, very successful in the SaaS world, right? Software as a service world. Uh, he released a book, I think not too in the not too distant past, called Buy Back Your Time. And his mantra is, don't hire to grow, hire to buy back your time. Don't hire to grow, hire to buy back your time. That's an incredibly profound way to look at things. So what we do is like, all right, we're growing. We have more projects. We have more customers. We need to hire people. Well, here's the thing. What you're not doing, if you look at it that way, by the way, that's a viable way to do it, right? We, we need more capacity to deliver the services or, or product we have. But as a leader, if you look at it that way and you're still in the weeds of decision-making at lower levels in your organization, then actually adding more people to your business to do the work is creating far more complexity and is actually bogging you down even more. So your hire in some situations should be, let's hire more delivery capacity for what we do. But you as a leader, if you're not hiring someone to take a lot of the administrative stuff, the weeds stuff that you once were responsible for, you won't get back time. And when you don't get back time, there is no hope for you on longer term thinking. I, it goes back to like, I am not worried about whether I can swim the 100 meter freestyle in a shorter period of time if I'm drowning. I'm just figuring out how the heck do I stay alive? So let's take care of the I need to stay alive thing first, then we can have a conversation about how do we strategize to get in a training regime to actually swim the 100 meters in a, in a, in a shorter time. Yeah. I, and I, I came across Martel uh, by accident, by just you know, learning on or doing my best to learn on a regular basis. And I started reading this book. And man, I, it's like I'm going to read the entire book, but that alone was worth like the couple hours worth of videos I watched. And um, and and starting the book was like, don't hire to grow, hire to buy back your time. Hmm. I just realized you have time. Your capability to think long term. It, it's it, like you will have, you will be able to see really distant futures really clearly, because you're not under pressure. You're not drowning anymore. Yeah, and that's one of the challenges I have when I'm working with a client early, <clears throat> is uh, they don't. Um, it it actually is foreign to them, like because they're in some sort of pain, uh, struggle. Usually when folks are coming to us, uh, they, they're, they're, they're desperate. There's something going on. You know, they've, they've hit some wall of frustration or desperation that, uh, that has caused them to say, you know what, it's time for us to get a pro to help us with this thing. You know, same thing with like medical stuff. And, you know, I, <laughs> there's a great Brian Regan skit where he's talking about uh, going to the eye doctor to get glasses. And he says, who, how did I put that off for seven years? You know, I mean, I, he's like, I could have been seeing things, you know, and how, <laughs> how is it that that's not at the top of your to-do list, you know, to be able to see, right? And we're so bad at prioritizing important stuff. Uh, and we can, some of us are worse than others at it, but um, I think that's part of the value of a good advocate slash advisor 
is there point net things going, how long are you going to let that go on? You know, because that's actually killing you. Um, you know, and that's a, that's a medical person saying, t- saying too, like, Hey, this plus this plus this equals you dead buddy. So what do you say we take care of that? And that to me, that's part of the value of in the advisory coaching, whatever space is, uh, objectivity, right? There's somebody that's outside of your noise and, and trauma and able to see it without any emotion and go, well, you know, this is not that complicated, buddy. (laughs) You know, it's just a matter of doing the right thing in the right order for the right period of time. Uh, And here it is. Let me lay it out for you. Um, And then go ahead and go do that and come back and tell me whether you did it or not. And that's not, you know, that's not incredibly profound necessarily. It's just shrewd and wise and timely. And I think that's that's part of uh, part of the advisor hack, if you will, or how to pick a good advisor is somebody that is um, you you said first all first of all level of empathy, which I one hundred percent agree with, uh, and I would add um, able to bring clarity, you know. Or now, how do how do you decide if somebody's able to do that? You know, how do you go ah? The clarity guy, you know, and I think uh, you got to try him out, I suppose, and go, gee, did you learn some stuff? But um, um, anyway, so there's a there's a couple of things. Um, again, uh, I'll just kind of drop books and guides, advisors, teachers that I've experienced. Either I've literally hired them personally. Mm-hmm had a wonderful relationship or you know they've been kind of on the periphery through books or you know watching videos um, uh, Donald Miller wrote a book called building a story brand a number of years ago and the idea behind it is he wrote it in the context of marketing like how do you tell a great story that in the world of business a prospect could understand resonate with or a prospect could understand and not resonate with in other words build a story, a marketing message, if you will, that will resonate with the right hero or have the hero disqualify him or herself because it just simply doesn't resonate. So the seven part framework of, of his model is um, there's a hero or heroine, they want an outcome, they have a problem or obstacle that preventing them from getting that outcome, they meet a guide, The guide has a plan or process. The guide calls them to action. If they take action, they have success. If they do not take action, they have failure. So think a hero with a want, hero with a problem. So think want, problem, guide, process, call to action, success, failure. Those are, that should be the seven parts of Donald Miller's story brand f- messaging framework. Well, so want, problem, guide, process. What's the next Call one? to action, mm-hmm. success, failure. So it's actually like a really brilliant coaching model. Hmm. So a hack is leveraging that framework that Miller presented. By the way, that's a storytelling model or framework that has been around since human language, Mm. since we, whenever human language started, that model became real because it's how in cultures we tell stories. It's how we explain Mm -hmm. our culture. It's how we explain our history of facing adversaries and challenges to overcoming those adversaries and challenges to have success and the process that we go through and the wonderful people we meet along the way to help us through. Um, so I realized that as, as a guide, as an advisor, as a coach, one of the best things I can do is actually, you know, use that. And I want to, I want to highlight the guide step. So out of the seven steps, I want to sit on the guide for a moment. 
the guide brings two things, empathy and experience. So go back to the empathy piece. You say to me, like, I'm really frustrated, Preston. I can't, we, I, I'm, my leadership team can't seem to get this business to grow. My, the first thing I need to say is I understand, Mark. I've been there before. Now, my circumstances are not going to be exactly like yours. But the moment I say, I understand, Mark, I've been there before, I just took an enormous amount of pressure off you, or you took an enormous amount of pressure off your shoulders. Now, the next part is the experience. Like, based on how I've overcome my obstacles, I need to offer something. So my experience isn't perfect. My experience isn't going to offer the, the perfect tool or the perfect solution, but it's going to insist that I actually offer something. For example, um, this, for those of you that are watching this podcast, I've got a red journal in front of me. Uh, Michael Hyatt came up with this concept called a full focus planner. This thing doesn't leave my side. Like this is one of the best hacks I know of. Every single day, I plan out what are the three most important things I need to accomplish today. So let's go back to that long-term thinking piece. This is a capture tool. So again, go back to, I'm, I'm gonna probably drop a few hacks here. So in there, maybe just more just in the form of ideas. So a capture tool. What's the one thing that fails us every single day? Memory. I promise you, like you'd be the smartest person on, on all sorts of levels, we could measure that. Your memory is totally insufficient for the life that you want to lead. So why would we ever depend on our memory mm -hmm. as a tool of production, as a resource? Like that's, that's just dumb. Rather, have a capture tool. Now, the capture tool that works for me is this full focus planner journal where the, the core of it is, Every quarter, there's three or four goals, rocks, that I distinguish. But I, a missing component has been to go from a 90-day goal to what do I need to do today to accomplish that quarterly goal. That is a huge chasm for most folks. So here's a hack. Let's put a tool in place that allows you to actually discern on a weekly and daily basis that which is most important for you to accomplish throughout the week and every day that actually is an incremental step towards getting your 90-day goal complete. Introducing this to clients is a tool. And by the way, so empathy. Mark, I get it. I, like, I've been there where I've worked with a team of people who just simply don't like they can't get things across the finish line or they, they keep failing on these goals. Well, here's my experience just presenting a hack. And by the way, part of my role as a guide, I believe is to experiment. I'm gonna try some stuff out. And I'm gonna give my, I always say to my clients, I am gonna throw a bunch of stuff at you, a whole lot of it, the majority is not gonna work. But the stuff that does work, you're gonna thank me for. So here's a hack full focus planner. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to take your 90 day goal we call rocks. I'm going to have you actually start the first month of the quarter. I'm going to have you use this journal to every single day, including your weekends, distinguish the three most important things you can get done that day. In other words, if I'm going to have the best day ever, what are the three things I get done? Not the 30 things, Again, it goes back to short-term thinking has me pile on a bunch of crap into my day. Long-term thinking is it's a really short or small number of things that if I get those complete, add huge value. So I'm going to help you over the first month build a muscle or strength around three things every day. And then out in the second month, what we're going to do is we're going to extend that into the week. So now once a week, you're actually going to take a look at what the success was last week what's important for this week, and you're gonna pl start planning out what you should work on each day of the seven days. And if you literally just get in the habit, build a ritual, every week I plan for my week that has a correlation to my 90-day goals. Every day I plan out my day that has a correlation to my week, which has a correlation to my 90-day goals. I literally have taken a longer-term objective 
90 days and distilled it down to action I can take today. And by the way, since it's a physical journal, it's not dependent on me mem like remembering what I need to do. It's literally writing it out. So now I have a visual accountability tool. My clients that use a structure like this, their goal, they, we could take that to your leadership team that's been failing, say, we're gonna train them on this thing, this hack, and all we're doing is we're having them, to, we're, we're insisting that they stop using their memory, that they stop using ambiguity, that we start helping them use a framework of thinking and accountability that's actually a visual expression of accountability. If we do that, man, what a, you guys are gonna kick butt and take names. So I'm gonna put that in the, in the concept of a hack of literally, and it doesn't have to be full focus planner. It could be, a, there's a lot of really great planners out there. This one just resonates with me because so like the foundation, like the philosophical foundation of this is three most important today, three most important of the week, and you build that ritual daily and weekly, you get your 90 day goals complete. And by the way, this binder that I'm using, this journal, it's a 90 day binder. I create a new one every 90 days, mm. rinse and repeat. There's a whole bunch of other constructs inside of that that are very helpful. But again, it's like just long term, focus on what's most important actually helps us build mm. patience, has a stop depending on memory, starts putting it into external visibility, which creates accountability, and we get stuff done. So you just added one to our pick an advisor list, which is uh, tools. You gotta have yeah. some, you gotta have some things that are gonna help the client change directions uh, or work differently or whatever. And, so, and those are, I would call them deliverables of some sort, you know, something that you're going to hand them here, try this. Right. Yeah. And it's, I, I come from the school of, I don't, I'm a curator. Mm -hmm. I don't feel the responsibility to invent everything. So Hyatt's got a great tool. Let's use it. Uh, he recently rolled out a certification program uh, for anyone. Uh, we got certified in it, which allows us access to actually teach and train specifically on his content and the, and the constructs of Full Focus Planner, mm -hmm. which again, is one of those like, I, I want to know it enough so that we go back to the guide, right? Empathy is I've been there, experiences, I have a tool and I know how to use the tool and I know how to teach you to use the tool effectively. That's how I kind of translate the experience part, the, the experience re responsibility that a guide has. Um, Dan Martell, like, I'm going to start handing out this Buy Back Your Time book to every owner, every leadership team member of my clients, but certainly every owner. That like, if you're going to hire, don't hire to fill, like, don't hire to bring on more capacity for operations, hire someone to take stuff off your plate. And, and again, I'm not saying that hiring to increase capacity is a bad thing. I'm speaking specifically to our clients, the leadership team members, the owners of the businesses, where their most valuable thing they could do is get more time to, to be able to think longer term, increase that that level of patience that they have access to so that they aren't mired down in the worry or the guilt of stuff that's working or not working. Um, other hacks. Uh, I think, Mark, we probably talked about this in a previous one. I'm going to go back to Sullivan. I believe I need to give Sullivan attribution for this. The root of all unhappiness is uncommunicated expectation. Hmm. So... I'm gonna go back to the client I was with yesterday and they were frustrated like this, we've got this direct report that's underperforming and we talked about, okay, Jack, what's the one decision you can make right now based on what you do and don't know that's gonna lead us to a particular action? And he said, well, I gotta create this job description. Well, I have a strong opinion, job descriptions are great to put on LinkedIn or Indeed when you're hiring somebody. I think it's an insufficient, a job description is an insufficient tool when it comes to garnering absolute simple clarity for what a seat in your organization is responsible for. Mm -hmm. So a client and I got together and we created this tool called Roles and Goals. 
So the roles of the within a seat in your business and the goals of the seat in your business. So let's just take this the sales seat. So if you a sales manager, director of sales, however you want to title it. It's a five component model. What's the number one most important goal or output for the sales function in your business? What's the process or processes that will help achieve that goal? What is the team or teams that will help you accomplish that goal? So goal, process, team. And then based on the goal, what are the two ideally weekly metrics, KPIs, that we would track to know that we are making progress towards the goal? So goal, process, team, KPI. And I just, I always encourage two KPIs. There's the five components. So let's pretend that it's, uh, let's pretend that it's um, gross profit. And let's say that gross profit number for the year is a million bucks. I could write a director of sales job description that has 3,000 bullet points of tasks. That's 100% useless to us on a leadership team to truly understand what's the value of this function we call sales in our business, job description is totally useless. Mm -hmm. However, you and I align million dollars in gross profit. Okay, that's a really important, what do we do with a million dollars in gross profit? That puts all sorts of capability back into our business. All right, well, what are the processes that sales would own to generate a million dollars in gross, gross profit? There's gotta be a buttoned up sales process. There's gotta be a buttoned up marketing process, account management process, a client retention process. And by the way, client retention doesn't necessarily exist in operations, it exists in sales. Maybe we negotiate account management is more about the delivery of what we do. So you know what? Sales is not gonna own the account management process. Sales is gonna own the, uh, operations is gonna own the account management process. In other words, we go through negotiating what's the, what are the core processes that will have a direct impact on delivering on a million dollars in gross profit. Third, what are the, what's the team or teams that, we, that sales needs to manage so as to hit the million dollars in gross profit? Well, definitely a sales team, and based on our process, marketing team, and based on our process, client retention team. Like Those are the three teams. Now, whether they're internal employees or external contractors or partners, it's irrelevant. I have to manage humans that sit in those types of functions and I have to guide them if I'm running sales. Next are the KPIs. Again, this is off the cuff. It's like, well, if we do quotes that have a margin above 36%, well, then every week we're going to measure how many of our quotes did we quote at over 36% gross margin. Then proposals that are approved by you know the same number. Mm -hmm. So quotes and proposals become, in this hypothetical, quotes and proposals become the weekly KPIs because our business is a business that is consistently quoting consistently turning those quotes into proposals. And ideally we close in business that then gives us the gross, leads us to the gross profit number. What was the frustration that this tool was born out of was, man, how do I explain to Preston what his job really is all about? Way being like more important than the bullet points of a job description. Like that happened to be one we invented, but it was born out of I was frustrated as a guide. My client was frustrated as a business owner. I'm like, let's just make something up. Like, what is the essence of clear expectations for any seat in the business? By the way, those five components of goal, process, team, and two KPIs, you could apply that to 100% of any seat in the business you have, whether it's sales, operations, finance, administrative, technology, it's irrelevant. Like figure out what's the number one goal, what's the process that leads us there, what's the team that leads us there, what are the two KPIs that, mm -hmm. that define progress. So Jack, yesterday, we introduced that tool 
man, the light bulb went on mm-hmm. for him so fast. I'm like, mm-hmm. oh my gosh, like I know how to complete this. Mm-hmm. Like, all right, Jack, you complete that over the next week, get alignment with your team. And then the next week, you go to your employee and say, let's have a conversation about this. How can we set you up to win on these five points? Yeah. All of a sudden, it's like, man, now we're seeing results. Or we're not. Either way, we win. Like, if I'm the direct report that Jack's got a problem with or Jack's got an issue with, I'm either going to step up and be able to do it because now I see it clearly, or I'm going to raise my hand and say, yeah, that's not me. Either way, we win. I like that. I uh, do, you, do you think there's multiple goals? I mean, I want to keep it simple, keep it pretty, pretty, uh, pretty uh, primal, maybe. Like, or like, hey, there's just this one thing. But is there sometimes, like, for instance, I think about your uh, the business development component that you were just talking about as an example. Sorry, I was way off my mic there, but. Maybe the second a second goal might be build the team or or develop the team or or recruit kind of constantly recruiting of that team or something. So yeah, let's hit these this margin, gross gross margin, gross profit. Um, and let's get the bench built or get set up for this next phase or and then maybe there's something around uh, some strategy, you know, come up with that big strategy, you know, and those are, that could be roles, I suppose, or mixing roles and goals. But, um, but I, I love this. I'm just wondering if you've, uh, as you've kind of cracked this loose, if you think there's a, a couple of goals uh, in there. My short answer is no, there's one. Like, and if the one doesn't happen, the other ones don't matter. Is that so kind of, let's go back. I, I don't know if I captured all of them. I think I heard, and maybe I'm adding some things, like recruit, hire, train, onboard strategy. Like those were five concepts mm-hmm. I thought, mm-hmm. again, whether they're five or not. So for what outcome would we ultimately want to recruit? For what outcome would we hire? For what outcome would we train? So it all come back to that one goal. Yeah, that's why. And so th- that's that's one reason. Ultimately, all would that the, be part part of the process. Then maybe yeah. So, so that exactly. Okay, so so it. what happens, Mark, is for so let's come back to like a, a separate and for me a more clear realization that I've had in the in my role. It's that you and I were in a world with uh, another organization, and they use the analogy: the difference between the sun and a laser. The sun has massive amounts of energy, but the energy is dispersed. So here on Earth, I might step outside here of your office on a really sunny day in the middle of summer, and I might get a sunburn. It might be uncomfortable. A laser beam has far less, exponentially lower energy than the sun. But if I ran a laser across my hand, it would do major damage, like not a sunburn. It literally could actually sever my hand. What's the difference between the sun and a laser? One thing, focus. It's like really, a, it's a really brilliant concept. So one goal puts total focus on an outcome hmm. that we directly relate to the success of a commercial enterprise. What you mentioned, and again, whether they were the exact ones or not, recruit, hire, train, onboard, and strategy, those are the hows. So Mm -hmm. to your point, those are the processes. We Mm -hmm. confuse process with goal on a regular basis. And that's been a a realization I've had to arrive. Like I didn't see that because I would say, yeah, our goal is to hire three people. Well, why? Like why would we hire three people? For what outcome would we hire three people? So let's go back to the role of a guide, like my job is to ask a question, like why would we hire three people? Is it because we've got a department that's complaining about being overworked? Well, yeah, they seem to be really overworked. Okay, have you communicated to the existing department members? Have you actually done a roles and goals exercise with them and clarified exactly what they need to do? Because I bet if you do that, They would be able to delete a lot of stuff they're doing, which actually increase capacity, which would lower their complaining about overwhelm, which would lead us to we actually don't need to hire anybody. 
my experience tells me many organizations hire too many people and they do that because they hire based on complaining. They don't hire based on true capacity increase. I have a department that's complaining about being overworked. I need to hire people. What I realize is now I have five people that work part-time mm -hmm. versus three people that yeah. work part-time and complain. Yeah. The trigger is discomfort, not strategy or not uh, end results. Yeah. And by the way, I'm not, I'm not advocating we work people to death. That's not right. the point. Sure. You go through a roles and goals exercise, I promise your team members will be able to delete things they're doing because they realize they have a task that's been assigned to them that does not have a correlation or a high enough value proposition for the goal that the department is trying to accomplish. It's, it's like one of the best gifts that come out of an exercise like that because you could do that roles and goals, not just for a seat, you could do roles and goals for a department. Holy crap, like we don't, we can delete a whole bunch of stuff this department does because it doesn't have a direct impact on the goal, that output that we're really seeking. So with the goal, you can, are you kind of saying, does it fit here? And I, th I it's, it's, this is what I'm hearing is, hey, this is why we're here. We're here to achieve that thing, that one thing. Yeah. It's purpose. It's, uh, this is what a victory looks like, a singular victory, a championship at the end of the year sort of thing. Does that fit? Absolutely. And so, you know, I've heard a number of times, um, I can't remember who said, like, culture eats strategy for yeah. breakfast. Um, then I've heard, if you don't know your business model, culture doesn't matter. I mean, like, there's all these, like, quips. I think they're all valid in, in some ways. I'm arriving at the opinion, if I don't have clarity of a simple and singular outcome, then... I am not going to build the best culture. I'm not going to form the best strategy. Mm -hmm. Like, in other words, like those things are going to be so Im importantly influenced or guided by the output, the outcome, or a goal. Mm -hmm. So, like the business model in our own business, Uh, we're in a trade your time for money model. We've been in that for a long time. It's a great model, right? Like we're 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 blessed. Like it's been working well. Um, it's a high margin business model. But we actually want to continue to increase revenue, but reduce delivery time. Well, the current model doesn't work. I could change. We could change our business model of like a thousand different up potential business models we could use. But what informs us on the right business model is the goal we set first. What informs us of who we need to, like the partners we need to bring in, the goal tells us what kind of partners we need to bring in. The goals tell us what partners we do not need to bring in. The goals tell us what types of guides and mentors that we need to bring into our own business for direction. Now, I want to do this on a quarterly basis and revisit because at times, because oh, I want to come back, the best thing you can do is choose one goal and then start using this construct of this roles and goals idea for the next 90 days. And then let's revisit it. How did it work? Did we get more clarity? If we didn't, was the goal not right? Do we not have the right people? Are we not setting the ancillary right priorities? So we can, we're going to dial it in. And I don't believe it's permanent. You know, for us, increasing revenue, decreasing delivery time is the goal probably for the next two years in our business because it will probably take that long to create that outcome. But along the way, that's informing us of strategy, of hiring, of who we hire, which culture plays a huge role in, how we hire, how we onboard. Like, in other words, the punchline being that def defining that singular goal, it becomes the the focal point. It becomes the north star for which we make the rest of our decisions. That's probably the simplest way to say it. Yeah. Well, I think this is really powerful, uh, practical too, and and to often these things go together. Powerful.
powerful practical. Um, I was thinking about what you're saying there uh, with, and I pulled up here my kind of purpose, I personal purpose. Like my wife and I went off to um, Mexico a few months back, February. Well, so it's what is that? Four months ago, and we've been kicking this around for a while and and working on our family vision family core values uh, or guiding principles um kind of talking about so i have these six grandkids and uh you and i were talking before we got started here about youngsters these days you know and so forth and there's something really different. Like, and I know that it's kind of cliche for folks that hit their 50s, 60s, 70s to be like, well, youngsters these days. But this is a different thing. We're in a different world than anybody else has ever been in. It's just really much, much more different than the other different worlds that others have experienced. That There's an exponential hockey stick kind of deal. There's that, you know, rocketing towards singularity, et cetera, technology increasing and so forth and so on. And, uh, you know, there's a question of what it means to be a human now. Mm. Uh, and that human and humanity and technology are starting to merge, which has arguably not happened anywhere close to what we're having now, you know, and, so anyway, as my grandkids are starting to grow, I've got, you know, grow up. My oldest is seven, and um, my wife and I were noodling on, well, what is our purpose? Like, what are we, what's our role? What's our goals? goal? And just kicking that around and trying to make sure, hey, are we, are we being distracted by some dumb series on Netflix, mm. you know, or or something, you know, uh, uh, less good. And so after talking about that and, and on our, and we took two weeks, we try to once a year take at least a week alone. We took two, t generally take a couple, um, and a couple of weeks, not another couple. Like we go, <laughs> <laughs> we, we ban other folks from it. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, so yeah. You're, you're working on your family. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. You're oh, working yeah. Working on your future. It's family vision. I mean, and a vision is, a vision is uh, an unseen picture. It's it's a it's an oxymoron, you know. And this is one of the things I work on with. So when I'm doing executive coaching, and I'm working with, let's say. A, well, it's a leader. So whether it's the visionary person or the principal or one of the principals or whatever, um, there's this dilemma about a vision. Somebody's like, hey, I got this thing we got to do or we got to be or where we got to go, you know, and and everybody in the like, you know, <clears throat> warehouse is like, what the, <laughs> you know, um, and, and, and the and the principal is all frustrated. I was like, well, Bob, uh, listen, buddy. And so he'll call me. They'll call, whatever. They'll call and say, can you believe those knuckleheads out there? I said this thing, and they didn't get it. I'm like, well, Bob, listen, buddy. Um, a, there's this dilemma when it comes to vision. And uh, there, are these, there are three of them in series, and the, they come one right after the other. Uh, and the first one is that you're dealing with people who don't know that they need a vision, you know, and you're handing them a vision and you're assuming they understand a vision is a big deal. And that's the first problem is you've got to help them realize they actually need one uh, and before you give it to them. So once you get over that and they're like, oh, great, thanks, boss, I need a vision, there it is, or, you know, kids, family, whatever, culture, <clears throat> Cool. Okay. So they figure out, oh, they need a vision. Great. You got over the first hurdle. Second hurdle is that a vision is a invisible picture and it's really hard to communicate. 
because you say a few words and you go, there, they saw it. And they didn't, you know? They just sort of nodded their head and then they went back to work. Um, you know, and often with a business anyway, um, you're kind of helping them, trying to get them to see, here's why we're serving this client. Here's why we're serving these customers. Here's why we're setting up the line this way or that way because it brings about these great results and the folks back at home are going, man, that was great. We're going to buy some more of these things. And here's what it's going to do for your family and for your future and, you know, whatever. And the boss is all frustrated because he knows that maybe in, in innately or intuitively or kind of maybe natively, and that's why they're there. But they don't, like, they just get frustrated and say a few things and nobody gets it. So, like, buddy, you got to paint a picture here. You got to create, you got to take this thing out of the ether and put it on paper and put it on the wall and put it in print and, and make little charades about it and name rooms after it and, you know, and, and get the client to come in and talk about it and get these folks to go, oh, that's what we're doing. You know, you got to connect all those dots. So you're putting, I call it putting clothes on the invisible man, you know, where there's this invisible guy and nobody sees him. And so you drape this jacket over him like there, there he is. So that's the second hurdle is that visions are invisible pictures and difficult to communicate. Uh, so they're, what do I say? Uh, yes, is the short answer. So in a couple of things. I love that you I love that you brought this up. Um Friday, last Friday, long-term client, the one owner, one of the, one of two owners for early on in our relationship was been wildly frustrated that the rest of the team couldn't see his vision. Mm. He the leadership team has turned over in the 5 Five years we've been working together, the leadership team has turned over entirely three times. Mm, wow. I have the, a couple the, clients the, like that. Yeah. The only people left <laughs> have been the two owners. Mm. So he's been, why can't they see it? Mm. So, yes, please. Um, We're drinking Green River, by the way. Green River, Kentucky Straight Bourbon. Uh, that's good stuff. It's so good stuff. Those Highly bourbon fans, uh, Green River. Green River Bourbon. Wildly frustrated. Why can't they see it? Demanding, like fist-pounding conversations with the leadership team in their planning meetings. Why can't you see this? And you know what? You're all, some form of you're all losers. You're done. And they self-select out. Uh, we took a pause in working together. Nine months, came back. Friday was the second planning meeting since we have re-engaged. Started a little bit the first planning session 90 days ago, but this one was overt. I mean, it was so obvious. The owner realized, like, my vision is my vision. I see it so clearly. I'm wondering if demanding everyone see my vision actually is almost impossible. What if I invited them, we invited them to formulate their own vision of what they see for themselves, and then we help them understand how does their role in our business help them achieve their vision? So it's one thing to have a vision for the, for the organization or purpose. I'm a huge believer in that. Mm -hmm. um, I believe our purpose or vision is the vehicle for which, with which I will pursue my goals. So my the destination are my goals, the purpose or vision is the vehicle I'm gonna to use to get there. In our world, it's the pursuit of fitness. We wanna help entrepreneurial leadership teams achieve their ideal level of fitness. That's our vehicle. Now our goals will be the destinations that we use that vehicle to get to. Certain amount of revenue, certain number of clients, certain number of days of delivery, um, the accomplishments that we've set forth as goals, we'll use that vehicle. 
to 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 get there. But what my client did on Friday was it is so profound. The buy-in of the team was like I've never seen before. They're all in now. They weren't resisting his vision. Like we realized we all have a vision of a future of the ideal outcome. And if we can translate our roles in the business from owner to all of the functional leaders, let's figure out a way to translate mm -hmm. that. Now we're engaged. And by yeah. the way, if I have engagement of people because they see how their role and the goals that they achieve via the business help them achieve their own personal vision, mm -hmm. then guess what? Guess what benefits the business? Yeah, Un it's a win-win, right? Un Mutual, unbelievable, right? So maybe a little bit of a of a, of a spin um, on on that, but and again, just in terms of our process, like making money we thought was kind of the vision for us when we started this. And then when we did that, it was insufficient. So then it was like, well, if we're making money, we can make a bigger impact. Then the impact we could make became that. And then that was insufficient. And then what we realized is like, we want to help realize an outcome on a much bigger scale that we're never going to have a direct we're never going to touch directly, but I go back to ultimately if like I, if in our little business, we can help entrepreneurs take over this world. Like I believe the world's going to be a better place. Uh, whether, you know, if I, whether I step on toes or not saying this, like big behemoth corporations, I don't think are the future mm -hmm. of <clears throat> this country. I don't think they're the future of, I don't think it bodes well for any of us. Yeah. I, but I think, you know, like endeavoring to produce something or endeavoring for outcomes, I believe is the definition of the word entrepreneur, endeavoring of some sort. Like, man, can you imagine if everybody was endeavoring? Yeah. So yeah. big picture, way out of our control. We're not going to have a direct, we're not going to touch all that directly. Mm. But why not give it a shot? Yeah, that's the corporation. I, I want to come back to that because I think it's a big deal. And this all ties into why are we doing this? Yeah. You know, why does it matter? Um, what, you know, why, why are kids struggling these days? You know, kids as in 25 year olds, 30 year olds, 18 year olds. Um, the third hurdle in that visionary dilemma is uh, visions disrupt. So mm -hmm. they, they force, they create a, a disruption or like, hey, where we are now isn't okay. Like we have to change, you know? And, and when somebody gets, sees the vision, they're like, oh, so does that mean I gotta, like we're gonna change where my desk is or who I work next to? Or we're gonna, so that's why we're selling the building? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's not gonna serve us in this ultimate destination. Um. A lot of times, and going back to a little previous part of our conversation, um, and this is where I start with a client, is I create, help them create, or I try to get them to talk about, so I could write down and point to it, what we call the land of awesome. So if we work really hard at this thing for a long time and do a great job, where are we going to be? Like, where are we trying to go to? What does it look like? And if you were to kind of, uh, paint a picture of what the new reality would look like five or ten years from now. Um, what must be true for us to just be freaking awesome? Uh, and a lot of times they don't know what to say except money. Well, blah, 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 revenue, blah, 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 profit. And um, I push on them a little bit. Say, hey, if the owner of your local sports pro franchise were to say, my goal is... X profits, X revenue. What would you be do, doing as a fan? What would you be doing as a, an employee of that organization? You know, like you're 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 wearing their shirts and their hats and their you got their bumper stickers on there and you're you're tailgating and stuff. Like it's nothing it has nothing to do with revenue, buddy. It has now revenue must be there, but that's not the goal. Like it's it's a vehicle. It's evidence maybe that we're on the right track. But it's not the, uh, and it may be some kind of fruit, but it's not, um, it's not the good stuff. 
you know, the good stuff is the human stuff. It's the purpose. It's the meaning. It's the, it's the why that is rich and, and human. And coming back to like my family vision even, well, so anyway, that third, that third part of the vision is disrupting, uh, which means, you know, we're going to start cutting loose the things that aren't serving us getting here. Um, as I'd work with a visionary type, I will say things like, buddy, we need a vision that's compelling to all, not just to you, not just to you as an owner. The owner vision and the organizational vision are may not be exactly the same, but they're married together. They have to, they can't conflict. They have to be mutually supportive. You know, so taking a, a, a professional baseball team, you know, NBA team, um, their vision is, hey, let's win the World Series. Um, as an owner, they also want to be profitable and have something easy to run and fun to run. Um, I have a client, one of their goals is uh, profitable and fun to run. You know, that's their next where we're headed to next. And you guys are listening, I'm sure. <laughs> so I won't say their name, but um, they're big fans of the podcast. But uh, that's that's part of our goal next. And we measure that. And it's kind of subjective. And every time we get together, every, every other month with these guys, uh, we'll measure progress on that. Hey, is this more fun? Are, are we fun? Yeah. Are we profitable? Kind of. Or are we fun? Kind of. Yeah. Profitable? Yeah. Whichever, but but we got to get both happening, and and so we take rocks around that to to get that to happen. So my kind of fi- family purpose, and I, you know, uh, we we developed this, my wife and I together. Um, first of all, it's to build a house of significance, full mm-hmm. of rare and valuable treasures, and that could be physically, um, it could, be, but it's. The physical serves the next level, which is relational. I think of it as an iceberg. The tip of the iceberg is the obvious part, sticking out of the water, right? But the big substantial parts are under, underneath the water, at least on a classic iceberg, mm-hmm. you know, metaphor. So it's relationally, and that's kind of like, I would say, eternally, you know, almost. Um, like, or, or multi-generationally, Um uh, so that's the first thing, the first kind of purpose, build a house of significance full of rare and valuable treasures. So that's grandkids. You know, it's uh, helping to raise grandkids and kids that are healthy and sane and secure and fully tooled for the future, able to help build great nations and help to build great businesses and help to create cultures that have that are worth fighting for, that are worth, you know, protecting. Um, so that's the first one. Second one is uh, to know and be known by the ones I love. You know, and that's I'm like, well, that's not money, right? It's, 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 uh, so it's not epic vacations necessarily, but it's uh, sure something of significance. You know, it's, um, it's getting to know these folks and letting them get to know me in a way that's really rich and rewarding. And then the third one is to store up treasure in heaven. Uh, and, and, you know, we'll find out when we get there, quote unquote. <laughs> uh, but there's, and I, and I use uh, Maximus as my, um, you know, uh, paint, paint a picture with Maximus, you know, as they were going into battle there at the beginning of uh, Gladiator. You know, he says, uh, what we do in this life will echo mm. through eternity. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's like, well, and we all have some different opinions. And at the end of the day, they are opinions about what is after this. But, man, we should definitely, or at least my purpose, is to invest in such a way that um, my work matters later. So what awesome fuel, right? Because at the end of the day, Mark, I'm going to assert you're going to run into, in the goals you're pursuing, you're going to run into, you're going to encounter some storms. You're going to 
encounter obstacles and challenges, the proverbial dragons and, and demons that you're mm -hmm. going to need to overcome. Like having that be kind of the vehicle in which you travel, those, those things you just shared are going to offer some level of protection, some level, maybe some level of solace, but certainly some level of, of protection as you, as you pursue these things. So in other words, build a house of significance. Mm -hmm. Like you, you've defined a goal for your business. You want mm -hmm. to achieve X. Well, X is the destination toward which you're traveling. The manner in which you travel is going to be one where you have surrounded yourself with people. You surrounded yourself with a home that has significance, that actually operates from a level of significance, meaning we're not just doing, yeah, we got to take the garbage out. And that's our existence in life. No, like we're taking the garbage out because it it makes for a clean home. It makes for a, a an expression of respect for ourselves and for one another to have the trash outside in the garbage can versus inside the home. I mean, it's little nuances like that that I mean, I, I could probably go on a philosophical rant about like how you arrive at your goals, the work you do with your clients. You help clients win, you win in your business. So I'm going to make the assertion. You help your clients reach their goals, you're going to reach your goals. Mm -hmm. And you're going to do so in a manner that is surrounded by this never-ending pursuit of forming relationships and environment around you of significance. We're not doing this because we're going through the motions. We're mm -hmm. doing this because yeah. it's meaningful. We're doing yeah. this because... We're all pursuing something that's larger than ourselves. It, it, again, it's like, it's the, you know, sometimes I look at it as like purpose is the, is the fuel. Because it really, ours, we've discovered, there's a, so much inspiration for us in our organization. Um, in our family, one of the elements is get others to heaven. I am un, we're unwilling to have somebody fall victim to complacency, to temptations. We're, we're all going to fall victim to that, but like in a very temporary manner and get yourself out of it, back on a path where like you actually can get to heaven you know, in, in our world. So, uh, and I can, again, I could, with a longer conversation, I could probably walk into like, our business is actually fundamentally in support of that. Yeah. Like why, why am I not, I help clients achieve their goals through becoming smarter, stronger, faster, more fit individuals in a multitude of domains in their life. Mm -hmm. My sense is they're going to end up being better human beings at the end. Yeah. Yeah, sure. And, and I think a business owner, uh, I, I personally, this is one of my whys in wh why do I have a coaching business? Why am I a coach? You know, uh, and sometimes I'm like, why am I doing this? You know, and sometimes it's frustrating and I have to come back to the uh, driving why or I've forgotten my driving why. But I feel like we we have this voice with a person or a, a team who is shaping the lives of 10 or 100 employees or 300 employees, right? And their families and how they think and how they act and how they invest money and how they vote and how they buy and sell stuff and how they treat one another. Like, it's a big deal. And, you know, it's not a soapbox. Like, we're not, you know spewing propaganda, but we're impacting the people that are leading an entire organization. Mm -hmm. And it's heady work. It's really, really cool work to do. And we don't have to run the organization. We get to kind of come alongside and help them and then watch them go do it. And that's what coaching is. Like I tell folks uh, sometimes when I'm pitching to a future client, you're like, well, if, uh, are you any good at doing this? I'm like, listen, have you seen Rocky, the movie Rocky? Like, yeah. Well, see, I'm, I'm Mickey. 
Right. You know, and you don't want Mickey boxing. If Mickey's boxing, the movie's over in the first round. Like the guy knocks him out and he dies. Like, and that's me. Like, I'm not, I'm not, if I'm in the ring, somebody screwed up. You know, I have the context. I know what I'm doing. I know how to get Rocky to do what he's doing. That's my job. You go fight and I'll help you figure it out. But, uh, but the coach like gets, gets to enjoy maybe or take satisfaction in the victory of their client, you know, and, and I'm like a proud papa many times where I get to kind of go home and go like, man, my guy crushed it today. Uh, he, he finally figured this thing out. Uh, he finally fired that guy that he's been fretting over for three years, you know, and you know who I'm talking to. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, you know, and, and it's, uh, and I, so I, that's one of the, um, uh, I think non-negotiables in picking an advisor, coach, advocate. I love advocate is driven by purpose, a purpose other than money. Uh, I think that's how you, one of the big deals, you know, if that person's all about money as an advisor, whether it's an attorney or a CPA or a maybe a, a, a real estate advisor or M and A advisor or uh, HR, IT, I mean, there's so many, you know, logistics, other kind of consulting, lean, right? There's so many different kind of ad advisory uh, positions that a business owner needs. But if money's the driver, you may have the wrong guy, you know? You, you, you'll entirely have the wrong guy. Again, go back to mentioned earlier, like I am a card carrying capitalist. I love the free market. Like I believe prop, profit is capability. Hmm. Why would I not ever want to amass as much capability as possible? Why? Because, or no, why would I want to? It allows, it provides resources for fulfilling on purpose. It provides resources for accomplishing our goals. Like, are you kidding me? Like, I, I want to be a for-profit business forever and like way beyond me. I and mean, that's part of like, we're Natalie, my, my wife, best partner ever runs our business now that we made a transition a year and a half ago. She entered, she came into the business about three years ago on one question. She simply said, asked me in my over overwhelm, can I help in some way? Because she noticed like I was just, I was drowning. It's blossomed into a, a wonderful, like a whole new dimension to our relationship as husband and wife, our relationship as parents to our two kids. My son's starting to get a little involved in the business. I mean, anyway, all that being said, like if it were just about making money, those questions wouldn't come up. We'd have been satisfied. I would not have been overwhelmed because we were making money. But it's the pursuit of something bigger that is actually going to be not just exciting, but it's also going to bring a whole new slew of challenges. And for us, it's like raising the ceilings that we keep bumping into. Um, all that being said, coaching has been one of the one of the greatest gifts for me. I barely made it through high school, finally figured out how to be a decent student in college, left college wanting to be a teacher. Hmm. I, don't, I, I don't know why. Mm -hmm. like, I literally can't say like why is that. Um, we could make up a bunch of stories. This just seemed to be something that was really interesting. Uh, in a more traditional sense, teaching wasn't offering the opportunity financially, emotionally, intellectually, kind of is the, the path that I saw, the, the, the future that I saw. It's one of the most amazing professions out there. It's just not, it, was, it didn't like fit the future that I was starting to see. And by the way, that future wasn't clear. It was just like something was off in teaching in the traditional sense. And I went down the path of going to do some uh, graduate work to uh, pursue psychology. And as I looked into, well, what's the business of running a 
psychology practice, a therapist practice. And I realized, well, insurance was going to be a big part. And yeah, I've got a very strong opinion. I don't want third parties dictating how I run the business, uh, my business. So somebody literally, it was like one of the most random events, Mark. Hey, have you checked out coaching, like business coaching? I'm like, oh, well, what is that? Like, <laughs> they're in the business of helping soccer coaches be better. I mean, I have no idea. When I started to look at it, it just all of a sudden this whole new world unfolded. Mm -hmm. um, I think the biggest reason, like the why I'm in this business, um, and it's so funny because I'm like wearing this T-shirt. I told I stole it from my son. Um, it's it's better to be a warrior in a garden than a gardener in a war. Mm. And that has been, mm. when I saw him walking around wearing that t-shirt and said, all right, you're either gonna give that to me or I'm gonna, <laughs> we're gonna get in a little fisticuff for the t-shirt. Yeah. Um, and he's like, dad, you can have it. I got lots of t-shirts. Mm. I, I love, Henry's just like, to, like he's the calm waters mm. in the midst of the storm. Mm -hmm. um, I am like so interested in being a warrior and mm -hmm. and this in the coaching industry is one of the best mm -hmm. arenas mm -hmm. to go practice being a warrior and like my number one job I want to help my clients be warriors in gardens mm -hmm. cuz man if you're a gardener and a warrior mm -hmm. you're screwed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's great. I love it. It's a good combo, buddy. I love this. This is a treat. Here's to, here's to coaching, gardens, warriors, and family. Family. Slancho. All right, buddy. Well, let's wrap it. So, great combo. Talking about a lot of good stuff. Um, folks, you need a good coach. If you own a business, uh, you need a good coach. One that apparently has a level of empathy I agree with all these that brings clarity that has a bunch of great tools in their back pocket and they're driven by a purpose other than so, solid. business broken a smoking podcast in the can see you on the next one thanks Boom. Preston Truth. thank you Mark <laughs>